So th this work I'm presenting today is basically the first part of her PhD study, looking about how GPs and nurses work together in general practice. And I'd really like to thank the GPs and practice nurses who've given up their time so willingly to be part of this study because we've had quite an amazing response from the Medicare locals where we've done this study. So I think we're all fairly well aware that the workforce in general practice in Australia has really changed a lot in the last decade. There's been a growing feminisation of the GP workforce, solo GPs have given way to larger practices, the nursing workforce has exponentially grown, which I'm sure we're all aware of, and all these changes have come about as reactions to various health policies, budget announcements and things like that, and there's been very limited attention paid to how these changes actually impact on the workforce and the way that we deliver care in our practices. So the current literature around um, nurses and GPs working together was reviewed as the first stage of this project. And although there's been a fairly large amount of literature written about how pra uh, nurse practitioners and GPs work together, there's been far less attention paid to nurses and gen or practitioners working together. In fact, this review identified only 11 papers that really looked at GPs and nurses and the way they work together. And this literature review has been published fairly recently in, in Jan. And it identifies that there's a number of themes that were common to these studies that have been undertaken. A misunderstanding of roles and responsibilities, issues of respect, trust and communication, and the whole concept around hierarchy, education and liability that keeps rearing its head. So the aim of this study was to really look at the way that GPs and nurses work together in Australia. Oops. And I guess it was based on the premise that optimal chronic disease management and primary care is best delivered by multidisciplinary teams of knowledgeable, skilled clinicians working together to provide integrated care. So the questions that we were trying to address in this study were do GPs and nurses work collaboratively? <laughs> I'm seeing like nods and shakes. And what factors influence this collaboration or lack of collaboration between practitioners? And I think that when we started out in this study, we we sort of saw things in a different way and some of the data that I'll show you today has allowed us to think a little bit differently about some of the issues that we, we're talking about. So the study was set in the Illawarra Shoalhaven and South West Sydney Medicare local and the reason we picked those two Medicare locals is firstly they're close to us at the University of Wollongong and also they capture a, a mix of rural, urban, metro, pretty much the whole geography except for like inner city type practices, so it's quite a diverse region. So what did Sue do? Well, she basically has done a, so I keep touching the button. She's done a series of um, semi-structured face-to-face interviews with 14 registered nurses and eight general practitioners. And at that stage we realised that she'd really kind of got to the point where she wasn't getting any new data. And I was quite impressed the fact that she managed to get eight GPs to sit down for 45 minutes each. I think that was no mean feat. She probably deserves a PhD just for that. <laughs> And they were willing. <laughs> um, and the partic these participants volunteered through their Medicare locals or with a little bit of prodding in the right direction. We, okay, maybe a lot of prodding. <laughs> um, we audio recorded the interviews and transcribed them and currently um, we're using a process of framework analysis to analyse these interviews. So as I said, there were 14 RNs and 8 GPs that we interviewed. As you can see, interestingly, um, all the RNs were female. There were four female GPs who put their hands up. We did try and get um, GPs and RNs who worked in the same practice, so in some cases we are kind of able to contrast what the GP said versus what the RN said, but we haven't quite got to that stage of analysis that I'm going to present today. Um, the RNs were a little bit younger than the GPs, to some extent. The mean age of RNs was only 49, whereas the GPs were up around the 54 mark. Fortunately or unfortunately, the, the, the groups we got had actually been working together for a very long period of time. A couple were married. <laughs> and there, there were others who, who sort of had fairly close personal relationships outside the general practice. So we were a little bit mindful that that may skew some of the information. So we bore that in mind with the analysis. Um, there was a mix of full-time and part-time employees. And most of the practices from which these people came were private pra practices run by the GP principal who owned the practice. Interestingly, all of the nurses who volunteered, and I'm not sure whether this was a bit of a message, are paid above award wages 
and three of them get Christmas bonuses. So maybe we should track down who these nurses are and find out what their secret is. So from the data we've collected so far and the analysis that we've, we've done, we've kind of come up with three preliminary themes which I'm going to talk to you briefly about today. And I will stress that this data is very preliminary. Some of the interviews are still being analysed, so it just gives you a taste of where we're sort of going with this project. So the first theme was around trust and mistrust. The second was around parallel working. And the third theme around finance driving and models of care. So the first thing that came out was that the GPs needed to trust the nurses to perform a particular role before they felt comfortable, and that really impacted upon the way they worked together. I love this first quote. I just laughed when I read it. My nursing staff, the girls, and to be honest, I don't know which GP this is, so I hope it's no one's husband. Um, just the language that they use just really kind of tells you how that relationship works, doesn't it? It was quite, quite telling. Um, and even in the second GP, as the years have gone by, her role's expanded as I've become more confident in her abilities. So once they got that trust there, it really altered the dynamic and the way they worked together. Conversely, when the nurse hasn't gained the trust, there's less, less flexibility about where they work together. And again, the first quote was quite interesting. When the, when the patient rings and asks to get some results, I'm not terribly keen about the nurse telling results over the phone because there's a risk they might give the wrong information or get it wrong. Well, can't the GP get it wrong too? Um, and I guess some of the, the trust and mistrust issues came from, G and GPs recounted um, occurrences that happened in their practice where a nurse had done something wrong or had there had been some kind of mistake made, but there wasn't kind of a reciprocal recognition that GPs make mistakes too. And because this one nurse back 10 years ago that they'd worked together had made some mistake in some aspect of care, it was then kind of tarred that no nurse should ever do that again because nurses can't do that. So that was quite an interesting sort of dynamic that they obviously needed to get over. <laughs> in, in other aspects though, the, the, the mistrust that they were demonstrating wasn't really around something that had happened. There wasn't a reason for it. They just didn't perceive that to be something that the other person in the team could be doing. Now the second theme was actually one that was really interesting to us and it was about parallel working of the nurses and, and GPs and I guess when you think about it, in a lot of cases the nurses and GPs in general practice do work in parallel, don't you, in some ways, rather than working collaboratively. But when we started looking at what the nurses were saying to us, a lot of them spoke about having autonomy and practising autonomously and having their own nurse-led clinic to the point that one nurse actually ran her nurse-led clinic outside the general practice at a building three doors down because they, could, they didn't have enough room in the practice to accommodate it. And she felt that running this nurse-led clinic three mornings a week was kind of the pinnacle of nursing and she kind of made it because she was now running this autonomous clinic. And it made us kind of think, well, are we actually doing a bad thing for nursing when we're trying to, are we, should we be aiming for autonomy? Yes, yes, we should be autonomous practice, practitioners. I'm not saying that we shouldn't have nurse-led clinics. But shouldn't we be communicating back with the GPs as much as we want them to communicate with us? And whilst we need to be careful of the language that we're using, because in some ways we're shooting ourselves in the foot saying, that, oh, we want the GPs to work with us and be collaborative with us, but we'll go off and run our nurse lead clinic over here and won't feed back. So I think we've, there's a, an element of caution that needs to be exercised around that and thinking about what is it that we actually want to achieve as nurses do we want to be this autonomous person out here or do we want to be part of the team? And I think we just need to be really mindful of that. And I guess as a research group, we hadn't really thought that through before in the same way as we have now that we've sort of seen this data. And the final theme that came up, which I guess is not particularly surprising, <laughs> is around finance driving and models of care. The data seems to strongly suggest that the ways that the general practitioners and nurses were working together was really strongly driven by finances. And the, the nurses and GPs that we interviewed identified a number of strategies that they used to kind of circumvent financial constraints or use the financial constraints to their advantage. Um, one of the things was around GP and nurse funding, and I guess that's a perennial issue in Australian general practice, and I guess it's something we just need to move past and, and teach people to move beyond. And there was one practice that actually had done an amazing job of planning their, their model of care 
with complete disregard for the financial circumstances. <laughs> and they'd then gone back and worked out, well, how can we make this work within the, the financing we've got? And it was actually an amazing practice that really put the patient at the centre of their care and then tried to work out how they could make money to support that focus, which was quite an interesting way of looking at it. It was a very entrepreneurial GP and a very motivated nursing team who'd really unpicked the way they were working. But most of the GPs and nurses very clearly said it's a business. We have to make the GPs more efficient. The nurses spoke about doing things that were going to raise revenue. And I'm not suggesting that they shouldn't be doing that, but the, the, the language that was being used was very much about financing rather than how we can work together to improve patient care. And I guess there was a number of examples of where having doctors come in to consultations, not for any valuable reason to the patient's care other than being able to tick the item number box. And I guess what was kind of sad was that there wasn't an, a recognition that, well, OK, yes, they're coming in to get their MBS item number, but is there something they could do while they're there that could add value? <laughs> is there some way that their head poking in the door, could, could that be the time when you tell them something about that patient they didn't otherwise know or, or communicate something? And it was really, it was seen as a, a mechanism of ticking the box rather than an opportunity to work together. So I guess from, from where we're at so far is that understanding collaboration and teamwork between nurses and GPs is obviously a very complex phenomenon. And there's a number of factors that impact on the way that, that they work together. And I'm sure that's not particularly new to most of you. There's obviously a lot more analysis to be done of the data. We've got hours and hours of transcript that need to be waited through, for you to see by a PhD student. Um, and hopefully by next year we'll have a much deeper understanding of the, the data that we've got. In saying that though, we know that improving the collaboration between nurses and general practitioners has the opportunity to increase our satisfaction at work. If we've got a more harmonious workplace, if we feel that we're all contributing to a team environment, if we increase our job satisfaction, it's fairly clear that we're going to increase our recruitment of nurses into the area and improve the retention of the nurses we've got because there's going to be less burnout and less frustration. If we have increased recruitment and retention, we're going to have a more experienced workforce that again is going to build on itself. And if we have a more experienced workforce, we've got a good primary healthcare system that can support our community. Thank you. <laughs>